think this session we will hear many of the key messages repeated over and over again and uh, it's pleasing to me that both Mario and Nikki have reiterated some of the points so if you hopefully will get the message loud and clear from a lot of the points here where these are the key things that we need to consider when we're making return to sport or return to play decision making. Uh, it is a journey and as Mario said it begins from the moment of injury or even at some stages we, we prepare people for the rehab journey even before they're injured. And uh, as Marcel Proust said, we don't receive wisdom, uh, we, but we must discover it for ourselves after a journey that no one can take for us or spare us. And I think that as we walk that journey with athletes from the point of injury to return to sport, we realize that it requires wisdom as well as knowledge to be able to make good decisions and recognize that each individual's journey is individual to them. Uh, and so that it's very difficult, therefore, to take broad principles and just apply them and say that this is what you do with every single person. So it's again about having good contextual intelligence and good clinical reasoning skills. Uh, this is an interesting slide. Back in 2008 at the IOC Advanced Team Physician course, there was a survey done of the guys who attended that up in Norway. Uh, and this is a slide that Roald Barr presented back then in 2008, that I, I remember. And I just want to draw your attention to some of the last three questions there. So would you return a rugby player to the same game of asymptomatic after first concussion with no loss of consciousness? And 74% said yes. Then that dropped. Uh, then uh, if, uh, would you return a rugby player to the, the same game if uh, asymptomatic after first concussion with loss of consciousness? And 13% said yes. And then after a second concussion within, you know, a concussion within three months beforehand to the same game, 60% said yes. Now that seems quite remarkable in today's climate. Given that we're just after the Berlin Consensus uh, meeting, that is really quite different. And the point that I would, would like to make is that things change over time. And we make decisions at one point in time based upon the best evidence that we have, but we recognize that as our understanding increases, and that should therefore be integrated into our practice. So therefore, to say that there is black and white, this is what you do, is not, doesn't really future-proof us to make good decisions. But rather what we need is a very clear conceptual framework upon which to base good clinical decisions, particularly with return to play. And I think as we'll hear tomorrow from Tony Schneider's talk around concussion, things are particularly different from the perception of people back in 2008. So if we had to identify three key pillars of making good clinical decisions, I would suggest that first of all, you need a very clear conceptual framework for what it is you're basing your decision making on. There has to be in this interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary team, clear defined roles for each person and what they're responsible for. And then thirdly, it's important that we have the appropriate measures to be able to evaluate and determine and measure against that return to play. So we'll unpick each of those three now uh, at a time. Uh, we had a great meeting in Bern for the first international uh, meeting, the first World Congress. Uh, and off the back of that, as, as you, you've heard, most of the people in this picture and, and a few others were involved then in the development of the consensus statement, which you've heard a lot about already. If you haven't already got it, it's, it, it's open access and it's on BGSM and it's really worth reading. So the first pillar of good clinical decision making is having a clear conceptual framework upon which you build your decision making. Okay. And so uh, as we unpick some of that, first of all, we have to be really clear in our conceptual framework is, well, what are we returning to? As Nikki has highlighted, it's quite different mechanism of ACLs from a rugby player to a footballer potentially. If someone is returning to athletics versus baseball, or golf, you would expect, therefore, to base your clinical decisions on different factors. So what is the person re returning to? What are the unique factors associated with that sport? And how does that influence your decision making? And we'll look at this broad conceptual framework. But what is successful return to sport? We've seen that perhaps for the player, well, they maybe just want to get back to sustained participation as soon as possible. The first question that most athletes will ask us on a consultation will be, how long until I return to sport? They have a very clear goal focus. For the coach, he just wants to know that when they're back, 
how well will they play? How can I integrate them into my uh, team? So they're looking at very much a performance focus. And then the, the therapist, or Carlo there, is, is really asking the question, well, can, and he returns to sport, can I prevent new or recurring injuries? So there's much more of an outcome focus. So we have the player, it's a goal focus. The coach, it's a performance focus. And for the therapist, it's an outcome focus. And we make these decisions and assimilate that information very much within the context. So that contextual intelligence that Nikki referred to, the context of the sport, the level of the sport, the sociological and psychosocial components, and then the outcomes that each individual, and ultimately a good return to sport decision, will meet a positive outcome in each of those goal, performance, or, or if you like, re-injury focus of each individual. So we've seen this already. So is it return to participation? Or are we returning to which sport? Is it participation? Is it per, or is it performance? And where in that continuum is it? So we're really clear on what it is that we're trying to assess. And to consider some of the historical components, back in 2010, there were a series of papers presented by uh, this group, of which Ian Schreier was one of the key authors, where they looked at some of the sociological components of return to play decision making, and. Uh, how, what the role of the sports physician was, but particularly the first paper there by Crichton and colleagues about a decision-based model. And they presented this decision-based return to play model back in 2010. And that was a really, I think, a really important step forward where we looked at how do you do, how do you make good decisions and how does that relate to managing risk? And they looked at the three different stages of the health risk, the participation risk, and then our decision modifiers. That model, I think, was excellent, but uh, Ian Schreier, I think, took it a step forward uh, and looked at the start model that we've seen already, where, again, there's three steps. He has changed the titles and really made them a little bit more focused. And the first one being about, well, what's the tissue health like? How much load or how much force are those injured tissues able to sustain? Secondly, then, how, how are those tissues stressed by the specific activity, by the position played, the type of sport, the level, uh, and, and, and so on, and how do you assess that? Then, finally, ultimately, you hit what was before the decision modifiers, is how much risk are you prepared to accept? What is your risk tolerance for that individual? You might make a different decision the, when you're making it regarding return to play for a Champions League final than for a pre-season friendly, as an obvious thing. So there are things that you may have the same tissue risk, you may have the same tissue stresses, or the same tissue health rather, the same tissue stresses, but because of the context, you might increase your risk tolerance. So how do we make good decisions that we're comfortable that the outcome is the appropriate one? So what is your tolerance of risk? And this is an interesting factor because ultimately all of us make decisions every day in return to sport and we're, we're deciding what risk is acceptable. And if we waited long enough, we would be able to reduce the recurrence rate, I think, considerably. However, is that the best possible outcome for the individual? And does that help them to return to sport in as quick a time as possible? And what's acceptable for the athlete? Uh, having spoken to a number of physios in the English Premier League within clubs, and I ask them this question, they're happy with the recurrence rate, generally speaking, having assimilated that of somewhere between 10 and 13% of recurrence rates, and they expect that's okay. So if I have a 10 to 13% recurrence rate for my hamstring injuries, I can live with that. If it goes above that, I've got a problem. Because they recognize that it actually could be really difficult to eliminate risk completely. So if we think of the clear conceptual framework, the decision-making process, which factors are important, then how do we make those decisions? What are the rules of each of the people within that team? Well, it all depends on what your perspective is, and Nikki has highlighted this really well in her presentation. And this study, again, how, that was carried out in Canada back in 2010 was, was fascinating, and it said to the athletic trainers, or athletic therapists, the, the doc, sports physicians and PTs, that what was the most important factor for your return to play decision making. What you'll notice here is that the, the doctors, the MD, said that pain was the most important factor, whereas the PT said that sports specific skills were the most important factor. So depending on what your role is, you will focus on different things when you make a decision. 
And so it's really important to understand that we see this from a particular perspective, and that's why it's really important to have an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary shared decision-making process. Similarly, and uh, Nikki highlighted this study as well which by Ian Schreier and colleagues in Canada, said, well, who, whose decision should it be? And uh, I'm not looking in the detail of this graph, but it said who, you know, who was most appropriate? Who do you think is the best person to make the decision regarding some of these different factors? And consistently, each profession or each subgroup within that study said, well, we're best placed to do it. So funnily enough, the physios thought they were the best people to make decisions. The doctors thought they were the best people to make decisions. The athletic trainers thought the same thing. And so, well, somebody's right, or perhaps everyone's wrong. Uh, and I would suggest that, that actually it's where we have shared decision making that is much more appropriate. And so if we come back to our three people, our player, our coach, uh, and our, our therapist, with our different focuses, what role should we play? And Mario highlighted some of this. Well, for the, for the player, it's a more subjective feeling. It's subjective to them, and they are able to per se how comfortable they are with that and what their preference is. I really want to play this week. I'm comfortable to take the risk. So where, what is the player's point of view? I'm really not happy with this, even though you think I'm able to do it and there is pressure from the coach, they're still not comfortable. The coach themselves said, well, I only want him back if he's able to add to the team. He may not be at a risk of re-injury, but does he add something to the team or perhaps is he too slow? Okay, so it's not about re-injury, it's about performance. Whereas then, back to Carlo again, and he said, well, I want to evaluate his health status, and I want to be involved in this decision-making process of can I provide advice on the management and the outcome? So you see here that there are different roles of the different people within that shared decision-making. So what's your role? Can you understand and appreciate the position of the other people within that process? And how can we make a collaborative good decision together? So it has to be a shared decision-making process, I think, for return to play. So we've looked at the conceptual framework, we've looked at our roles. So what about the measures that we use to make our decision? Well, the START model highlights some of these. We look at things related to tissue health and tissue stresses, and we'll look at some of those in turn now. So if we take some of those factors and we think of the health risk, or if you think the tissue risk factors there, uh, highlighted here within this red box, which factors are important and how do we measure them is the factor. And how do we apply it to specific injuries? Because some factors will be more important potentially for an ACL than they will be for a shoulder injury or for a hamstring. So which things should we pay more attention to when we're making decisions around specific injuries? And so if we think of hamstring, for example, which factors are important? Well, this is a really nice study in terms of predicting time to return to play and uh, it was done by the guys out in Aspatar, and they looked at a clinical examination on day one and on day seven, and they also carried out an MRI scan. What they found was that the important subjective factors that helped me to predict how long it would be for someone to get back to return to play with a reasonable amount of accuracy was related to pain. Pain at the time of injury, the time taken to walk pain-free, and also if they played football, they were at higher risk than if they played other sports. So pain perhaps was a really important factor subjectively, but some of those correlates of pain for specific factors. The key physical findings were how painful was it during strength tests, and that on day one, how painful you were at inner range, whereas on day seven, it was how painful you were at outer range. And also then how strong you were. So what we see here, I think, is that uh, there are certain factors that we have to take into account both subjectively and objectively. And if we look at the, the, the correlation, if you like, between the clinical assessment and how accurate it is in return to play, this line here, if you look at the dotted line, this indicates a, you know, a, an R squared value of, of one or perfect correlation. And in this instance here, you see that a clinical assessment on day one has an R squared of 0.59. So it's, it's not bad and is reasonable, reasonably good. If we go seven days later, we can see the contrast. So clinical examination has an R squared value of 0.97. It, it has a really strong, good fit for being able to predict when someone might be able to return to play. 
So what about the role of imaging and how important might that be? Well, let's have a look at, at when you look at an MRI scan and can that help us predict return to play in hamstring injury? We see a pretty terrible R squared value of 0.13 indicating that MRI adds no additional value. So if we look at those things in the round, what we see is that clinical examination can offer reasonable accuracy for predicting time to return to play. So some of those factors, pain during certain activities, the pain at the time, the time taken to walk without a limp, or without pain rather, some of the factors around strength and pain during strength testing can help us make really good return to play decisions. In contrast, MRI adds no additional meaningful value in predicting return to play time. It might help us with diagnosis, but it does nothing about helping us make decisions with return to play. So if that's an example of some factors that might be important for hamstring, what about ACL? And we've seen these, some of these studies already. And this, I think, is a really nice study, and uh, Mario uh, uh, referred to it as well, is that there's four times higher uh, rate of re-injury in level one sports after surgery than level two. Okay, so 30% versus 8%. Somebody here, for every month where return to sport was delayed until nine months, the re-injury re rate was reduced by around 50%. So I've used this stat with many athletes who want to return to sport at seven months, and I said, well, if you wait two more months, each month you wait, you'll reduce your risk by 50%. Most people find that that's a really helpful and motivating statement. What they also say was whether there was asymmetry in quadriceps strength was a significant factor. But what this tells us that time-based, in terms of the time since injury, or surgery in this case, and functional return to sport criteria in terms of the symmetry of strength are really important factors to take into account when we're considering return to sport. But perhaps the most impressive or striking figure within this, and it's in the title, is that if you abide by these rules, you can reduce the risk of injury or re-injury by 84%. I think that's something that we have to take note of as therapists and working in this context. So therefore, if we make decisions that run contrary to this, so go back to sport early, or we go back to sport uh, with poor symmetry within our quad strength, then we have to be aware that we're increasing the risk of re-injury. So which tests, which functional tests are important? Well, a, a number of studies have looked at various things like strength tests, and typically it's length of leg extension or flexion or leg press, and then functional tests. I put functional in inverted commas because I'm not sure that all of these are particularly sport specific, but looking at these, and what we see is that actually no single test is able to even discriminate between the injured and non-injured limbs, never mind say that they're now able to return to sport. So what I would say is that no one test in isolation is able to discriminate. Therefore, you cannot rely or depend on one single test to make your return to sport decisions. It has to be a battery of tests. So just as it's a shared decision making in terms of individual, we have to assimilate lots of different information about the function of the knee and other factors and make an intelligent decision based on those multiple factors. Claire's re review, uh, which she may well make reference to, uh, again, was fascinating and uh, some really important numbers here. So uh, what was interesting out of those 48 studies with nearly 6,000 participants is that 90% has, uh, as per the functional measures, normal knee function. And 85% of them had normal activity-based outcomes. Yet for some reason, only 44% returned to competitive sport. Why? Well, I, what I take from that is that there are factors other than knee function that are important in terms of return to play. So it's not just all about strength or function. There are other factors that are important. Yeah. So we've considered the tissue risk and the health risk factors. What about some of the activity risk factors or the, the, the tissue stress? Well, the question that we would ask is, do your tests reflect the demands of the sport? And Nikki made comment on this. Do they challenge sport-specific skills, particularly looking at reactive agility? Is there variability in the testing? Do we add in unpredictable and complex movement patterns and recognize that we're dealing with an interdependent system and that it's not just one anatomical region in isolation? And how is that injured area involved in those sport-specific movements or that decision-making? 
being really clear in that conceptual framework of how that happens. The other question is, have they trained enough? And we've heard this from Karen earlier and again from Nikki in terms of getting the progressions right. So we've seen this, so I won't labor the point, but have they trained enough? Do we take people back too soon? So that's that time-based component that we talked about. So what does good progressions look like? Well, I think we like to think in the ideal world, it looks like this. Everything goes in a nice straight line from injury right through to return to play and return to performance. But I think in real life, it perhaps looks something different. And we, we've heard about the acute chronic workload ratio that, we discuss, that Karim discussed earlier today. And we want to ensure that we stay somewhere within this sweet spot of that acute chronic workload. But the real world probably looks something like moving at return to play, we have this huge spike in volume or workload. And as a consequence of this spike in acute workload, the acute chronic ratio is often, I think, way too uh, 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 low. And as a consequence, we have an increased risk of, of re-injury. And perhaps we need to then not just think about total load, but how do we pro uh, progress the different components? What about the tissue load? What about the neural load or metabolic load? What about the skills-based load? How has that been progressed? And what is the acute chronic ratio for each of these subcomponents? And have we given them enough time in terms of their return to sport? So I would pr pr uh, propose that actually we need a good stepwise increase in our loading with appropriate periods uh, built in of recovery for adaptation that we get to a level and we stay there for a period of time before expecting people to really get to that level. And as a consequence of this, that obviously means that that's probably going to take a little bit longer, but that we also need to ensure that we have done that in a very focused way and perhaps work harder on certain components earlier in our rehabilitation process. So how do we connect all of that information and make it really relevant? Well, this is, a, again, you've seen this already, and this is from the consensus statement. What you'll see is we take into account the injury characteristics, the specific area, the, the socio-demographic uh, uh, factors, and have a synthesis not only of physical uh, and psychological, but of those uh, uh, social, uh, social environmental factors. So it's a biopsychosocial model, and it's really about make, synthesizing this complex information and making good return to sport decisions. And this is summarized in this figure taken from the consensus statement, where ultimately we're really clear about what it is we're trying to achieve, our specific roles, how we monitor that, how we as an interdisciplinary team work together, and then we apply the start framework that we uh, considered earlier, apply that to shared decision making, and then in the context of good rehabilitation that has appropriate tissue loading, we get a successful return to sport. So, in summary again, to reiterate these points, there are three pillars for good clinical decision making. And firstly, we have to be very clear on the conceptual framework upon which we base our decisions. We need to also be clear on our roles individually and the roles of others within the broader multidisciplinary team. And then we have to identify what are the appropriate measures that I need to take into account for this athlete with this injury in this context. When we synthesize those things together, I think that helps us make better decisions. So hopefully that's been helpful and provides a bit of a summary of how we make good return to sport clinical decisions. Uh, I would also, uh, if you thought the uh, consensus statement was good and it was the product, if you like, of the first World Congress, I would invite everyone here to come and join us in Belfast in October for the second World Congress, which will consider optimal loading in sport. Thank you.